Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is Gabby, the Great American Broadcast Network. Bennett and this is the Ramble and about 25 minutes from right now we will uh, talk to our citizens panel and keep going until midnight eastern time right here on the uh, other coast of the the uh, let's see here the right coast of America but in the meantime we got to talk to an old friend we talk to once a week because we want to check in with him because well he makes me feel better about myself out to the west coast of the United States we go like a speeding bullet from a gun uh well, at the speed of the internet, uh, it's Larry Bubbles Brown, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Hello. We're rocketing through the bar tube like THX 1138. <laughs> That's where that movie was made, by the way. When they I know, yeah. They were building BART, so they asked, can we go down in the tunnel and use it? You know. Yeah. I'll have to watch that again. I think, as I recall, I saw it years ago. I kind of liked it. But. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was okay, you know. It was, it was, it was, you know, uh, uh, Lucas had a student film of THX 1138. And so Warner Brothers liked this student film and said, why don't you make it into a movie? So he took what was a good short film and turned it into a really dull, long film. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And uh, it was, you know, I mean, um, uh, certainly it, it showed promise, you know. And then uh, he made uh, American Graffiti, and then he went and made Star Wars. And then he was trapped for the rest of his life with Star Wars films, basically, that and Indiana Jones. Well, why didn't he... He had all that going for him. It seemed like he stopped making movies. He didn't stop making movies, really. He stopped directing them. He stopped directing, yeah. He got, uh, people forget this, he actually got mad at the Directors Directors Guild. Uh, Here's what happened. Uh, The Directors Guild had very specific rules and regulations about credits and how you should be credited on a film. And uh, uh, one of the rules was that uh, a director's credit had to be the very first thing that, uh, it had to be uh, on the on the opening of movies. In other words, it would always be written by, then directed by, and then the movie started. And and right. the director's uh, credit had to be at that point. Well, Lucas edits this film, and he feels his credit is best at the very end. You know how at the end the music swells, the thing Iris is out, and you see directed by George Lucas. And he liked it that way at the end of the film. And they said, no, you got to put it at the beginning of the film. He says, I'm not putting it at the beginning of the film. And they said, well, you've got to or or we're going to fine you. And he said, no, you can't fine me. I quit the Directors Guild. (laughs) Wow. And he quit the Directors Guild over that and ran the film the way he wanted to run it. Now, my thinking is, what a stupid rule. I mean, if a director wants to put his credit at the very end of the film, then who does it matter except to the director where he wants people to see his name? But yeah, that that's was part en- of the direction, actually. That, that was enough for him to be mad enough at the Directors Guild to quit. And from then on, um, and then they, they made some rule that said, yeah, it's okay to put it at the end because the film was so successful. So they, so they changed that rule. But he just never liked the Directors Guild and wasn't about ready to join again in order to direct the movie. So he brought in other people to direct the other ones. Now, maybe that was a good idea because later on, when he came out with the next three after the first three, uh, he joined the Directors Guild again and he directed them all and they were really terrible, terrible movies. That's what I've heard. Yeah. So, you know, and when people would say, well, gee, it wasn't really that good a film, I like to point out, I said, you know, it's the only the fourth movie he's directed. And they went, what? 
And I said, well, you got THX 1138, you got American Graffiti, you got Star Wars, and then you've got like whatever that first one was called in the in the second part of the trilogy, or the second trilogy, the first three episodes of the trilogy that were released secondly, if that makes sense. He had only directed four films. Why, the novice. Basically, and if you include the student film five times. Well, hey, uh, I, I think that uh, most directors get better with age, not worse. You know, they learn their craft more. And so people were always amazed when I said that. I said, not bad for a student film. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's only his, it's only his fourth film. And they go... Gee, I never thought about that. Yeah, well, you never thought about it because they always said George, Lu you know, Lucasfilm presents, but he always got other people to direct his stuff. You know, he didn't. He didn't do Indiana Jones. Uh, he didn't do uh, uh, the the last two Star Wars films. Uh, and by the way, they were very superbly directed because he got great veteran directors to do them. Um, so anyway, that's that, that's the story of George Lucas and yeah. And you think uh, I also thought that Coppola really hasn't done that many films when you think about it, right? Coppola, no, Coppola did quite a few. I mean, he's done he's done more than he's directed more films than Lucas ever has. Yeah, but he was so good, you kind of wonder. He just seemed like he kind of stopped, and I thought he was great. Well, you got to remember where he started. His his first film that was released was called Tonight for Sure. Now, most people don't remember this. But, I haven't heard of that one. But it was a skin flick. It was an adult movie. It wasn't porn, but it was, in a, it was what we call a titty boom movie. It was okay. like, uh, you know, like a Russ Meyer thing, you know, where Russ Meyer used to have all the women with big breasts yeah. and stuff. Well, he was really kind of capitalizing on that. And it's about a guy in the Old West who all of a sudden, when he's... He gets these visions. He sees all these women as being naked. All right? It was called Tonight for Sure. And I think he did another one of those, but I can't remember what the name of it was. But um, we got a copy of the film. I knew the guy who owned the rights to it at that point. His name was Arthur Morowitz. And he owned the rights to it. And I said, can we play it on Midnight Blue? And he said, sure. So we made a copy of it. Uh, I think we made a copy of it by actually videotaping it, by screening it on a wall and then making a copy of it that way. And we showed it on Midnight Blue as a cop apocalypse then. <laughs> <laughs> and it was his first film. <clears throat> okay. So he did a lot of that. He went over to Corman and he did, uh, um, I can't remember the name of the movie now. It was, uh, see, in my mind is, I'm just fucked today. Um, uh it was a horror film with, I think, Boris Karloff was in it. Uh, and uh, it was so-so, all right? And then there was a film, uh, he, did, he did the worst Jack Nich Nicholson film ever made. And I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, it, he didn't direct it, but he wrote it. Corman directed it. And um, uh, it was the one that... Uh, that Nicholson always liked to just denounce. You know, he, he I, I never was part of that movie. I'm sorry. I <laughs> uh, I didn't like that movie. That movie sucked. You know, wait a minute, let me see if I can find it. It was, uh, yeah, and it was, uh, what happened was they were making another movie with Jack Nicholson. Um, he did uh, another movie. Um, I think it was a Raven or something like that. I'm trying to remember. Let me get, let me get his whole, filmography here uh, it, uh, and it was early on um, uh, uh, let me see here huh. did he what, what, the, 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 oh the terror that was the name of it he did the raven in which he was the young uh, guy in that film and they they had what happened with Carmen was he had time left over with all the actors that were in the Raven, 
He had hired them for a couple of weeks or something, <laughs> and he had about three days left on their contract, so he decided to make another movie. Let's make a three-day movie. Let's make a three-day movie. And he made uh, The Terror with Jack Nicholson as the star. Uh, and uh, um, Jack, when I interviewed him years ago, I brought it up, and he said, ah, that was the worst picture I ever made, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, because he had already been in Little Shop of Horrors and uh, done a few films like that. And then the terror came along, and uh, it was, um, uh, a, a, he was the Lieutenant Andre Duvalier, okay? And the other actors in the film were, um, let me see here, other actors in the film were Boris Karloff, uh, Dick Miller, you may remember him. Anyway, he, 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 so, you know, there are always films that you don't want to remember you did. Uh, and uh, let me see here. Let me look up, uh, let me look up uh, uh, C Coppola. Coppola. Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, and then I go to, come on, there we go. All right. Uh, known for uh, film producer. I don't want producer. I want director. Okay. Uh, here we go. Down to the very beginning. Um, uh, this, uh, well, The Bellboy and the Playgirls, Tonight for Sure. Oh, then The Terror. He directed The Terror. This horrible Jack Nicholson film. Okay, I and gotta he, see that just for the just for the cast. I would like to see it. Yeah, but he was uncredited. He had three or four days as director, but he's uncredited. But I think he's credited as the writer. And then Dementia Thirteen, that was the film I was thinking about. It was a horror film. Then You're a Big Boy Now, Finian's Rainbow, The Rain People, The Godfather. Then he got you know then he got his rep. But he had done quite a few movies before he got around to The Godfather. Okay. He had done more films than Lucas did before he got to The Godfather. I saw You're a Big Boy Now when I was in high school, and I remember at the time it's, I really loved it. Then I saw it a few years ago, and I just said, wow, I can't believe why I liked it. But at the time, it just... A lot of time for, you know, in many cases for the times, the movies are good, you know? But then mm -hmm. you look back at them years later, and you go... I didn't realize it was that badly written, that badly acted, whatever. Yeah, because, I was shocked. Well, because as you grew up, you, you expected more out of a film. Um, and I've gone back to films that I loved and went, gee, this wasn't very good at all. I mean, I think we were mentioning last time I talked to you about, like, I love Lucy. We loved Lucy. We thought that was a great show. You go back mm -hmm. and watch them, they're really bad. Yeah, they're horrible. Yeah, they're really bad. But they're bad by comparison. For their time, you were going, ooh, ah, oh, this is terrific, you know. Um, uh, to begin with, nobody did these shows basically on film with a live studio audience. You know, so he invented that, Desi Arnaz invented that whole format of, of doing a TV show. So we, for its time, you went, wow. But now you look at it, and it sucks. All those shows suck. Yeah. They were overacted. There was also, if you remember, acting styles have changed. If you go back to the 40s and you see some of those early films, there's a whole different acting style. And it's amazing that some great acting performances actually escaped in those days, you know, like Henry Fonda in Grapes of Wrath, for instance. Uh, those films were well acted, but most of them were very corny because they were all stage actors who learned how to emote, you know. Yeah, very emotive. <laughs> yeah, very emotive, you know. <laughs> yes, let's go down to the theater. <laughs> Margaret, I love you. Yeah, well, good. I'd lose my heart on saying that. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so what's happening in the wonderful world of Larry Bubbles Brown? Well, I got a little, actually, I got a little upset last week. I, I was watching Netflix. It's uh, some show called Making a Murderer. Yeah. Have you, have you seen that yet? No, I haven't. I've heard about it, but I haven't. Okay, well, you should watch it. But it got me, at one point, there's a kid who I think is innocent. He's a slow learner and had a bad attorney. 
So he lets the he lets the cops question him without him being there, and this kid's still in prison. And I think he didn't do it, and you do. I just I've never liked the American justice system, and this made me hate it even more. I just think it's I people trump it how great it is. I think it sucks. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You have Netflix? No, my sister does. Oh, so I fair. see. Okay, I just I was I was yeah, sort of, I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> scared the shit out of me. I thought maybe we had brought you into the 21st century here, but yes. I guess not. Um, but I could see how people, you know this, but uh, I could see how people get radicalized just over the injustice of our justice system. Well, our justice system is uh, it is always favored the rich. Yeah, it's not white privilege, it's green privilege. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good, very good. Yeah, if you've got the money, you know, right now, for instance, as an example, we're fighting this whole fight over this apartment, the one we've been living in as squatters for the last five years. Um, it, it, we're, we've been fighting it, but the thing is, girlfriend has, like, uh, a loan we can take out on her apartment. It, it's, uh, you know... Whatever loan she can use the money for anything she wants to, and it's about we have about sixty thousand dollars. Well, so far we've had to pay out like fifty over fifty thousand dollars in lawyers' fees. We paid that whole thing down, but we've had that money there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else would have been out of this apartment by now. You know, if you couldn't come up with the money to fight this really extensive legal battle. Um, uh, you, you couldn't you couldn't afford to do it. I mean, yeah. I, if she didn't, we didn't have this loan that she had an ability to have. We wouldn't be able to get it either. You know, be able to pay for it either. But luckily, we've been able to pay for it, and we've been able to pay it down because she's working. And really, if you think about it, over a period of five years, what does fifty five thousand dollars come to in rent? You know, next to nothing. Like. Ten yeah. grand a year, you know, so thousand dollars a month. Um, but still, if you don't have the money, if you're accused of a crime and you don't have the money, you're dealing with a guy who's doing the thing pro bono because he's appointed by the court to do it for you, or he's a public defender. And they don't work their asses off. They want the easiest possible plea so they can get on to the other work they got to do. Yeah, and that's what this guy does in this uh, documentary. He actually works with the prosecution, and mm -hmm. it's just terrible. Yeah, and so um, I assume the guy got convicted. He got convicted, and he's uh, last year. I just read they he was it was going to be overturned, and then. He was about to be released, and then another court came in and said, "No, let's look at this again." And they they said, "No, keep him in." So, and you'll watch it. You'll be. I was so angry I couldn't sleep for two nights. But was it just one episode that you watched, or I watched about six. It was probably about ten. So yeah, yeah. So you didn't get to see how it turned out. I saw it. I just saw him be convicted. Now they've got a second season. Uh, a new lawyer has come in to take this case. She's found new evidence. But um, but you'll be able to see those episodes once you subscribe to Netflix. Or if I drive out to my sister's. <laughs> you can't even get Netflix, can you? I don't think so. You don't have to have a... You should have a fairly high, fairly decent. You have a high speed connection. Oh. Not even a high speed connection by today's standards, but you've got what? Dial up. Dial up. Wow. Gee, it can't. Aren't they putting anything else in your apartment house? They don't. AT and T said that they can't get into our building because it's so old. I think maybe the other people here must have Comcast or something. Well, if, you know, at and saying, well, it's too old, we can't do it. But is Comcast in your building? Yeah. Well, why don't you call Comcast and see if you can get a faster line? You might pay, only be paying a couple of pennies more now than you're paying for dial-up. You're right. I should do that. How much do you pay for dial-up? You won't, but how much do you pay for dial-up? I'm 20 for dial-up. 20 for dial-up. Uh, I would imagine maybe 30 35 tops, you've got yourself a high-speed Internet coming in. Uh, 30, I definitely would do that, yes. See, the other thing about uh, 
And this was a concept that took me a while to wrap my brain around when I first did it. They said, well, listen, once you get this high speed, it's always on. And I said, what? Because I was used to doing what you do. Dialing you turn a number. the computer on. And and it goes, <laughs> you get the noise. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you get the noise and all of that. And uh, then uh, um, you, uh, uh, but I wasn't used to that. And the concept of it's, it's always on. And yeah, it's always on. Whenever you go to your computer and you go to put in a thing in your browser, it goes right to the place you're going. It doesn't ever turn off. It's always on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I, at least I would, you could maybe, you know, you could then, well, of course, what kind of TV set do you have? Oh, I just got a, it's not even a flat screen. It, you got a tube set? Yeah, I got the last two. I bought it, let's see, I bought it in 06. It was one of the last tubes, yeah. You that know, when you, me, when you drop it. I think dead, I got a hernia getting it up here. When you drop, how big is the screen? It's only like uh, 20 inch. Oh, <laughs> Okay, and so the thing weighs like four hundred pounds. Uh, okay, so if you die in your apartment, and the the <laughs> it's got the people that come in here, the people that come in, feel like they went through a go, time warp. And they go, "Hey, Charlie, you got to come in and see this. <laughs> Look, he's got a twenty-inch tube set. He watched. <laughs> he's got fucking dial-up, and oh look, there on the floor, a flip phone." <laughs> What are you trying to do? Be the museum of bubs? What is this? <laughs> People might think I'm eccentric or something. I don't know. It could be called the Bubs Museum. We could, they could give tours. <laughs> you, I think you've gotten to the point where you don't want to modernize your life because if you do, you'll lose your reputation of being a Luddite. Well, People do. <laughs> <laughs> People, I mean, what I we, tell what, you, I bring, we, I bring my flip phone out on stage. The audience just loses it; they can't believe it. <laughs> the biggest laugh you get all night. That's is the biggest the, laugh I get now. Yeah, I just hold the flip phone up. This is my phone. Yeah, and what jokes go along with that? Uh, I, I don't even have to tell a joke. I just that's <laughs> it right there. That, that says it all. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, well, you know, I mean, if you if you ever modernized, we'd have nothing to talk about. Well, if you get out here, why don't you bring the video cam and just, we can shoot my apartment. It'll be a, we can make a, a little documentary. I don't bring a video cam. I bring my phone. My phone shoots 4K oh, that's right. you can video. Do that. It shoots 4K video. We'll come out. We'll do the documentary. The Bub Museum. The Bub Museum. I've never been in your apartment. Well, you will be. <laughs> you will be. <laughs> I gotta get you out here. Well, you're in my you're in my old neighborhood, basically, I'm right? Lot, probably like ten blocks from your old place. Yeah. 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 I wonder how much my old place is costing now. Well, I just saw it's the studio in my building. Just, someone left their rent stub down in the uh, lobby here. They yeah. were paying three thousand for a studio, a and yours was much bigger than a studio. A so. studio? Yeah. Oh my God. Jesus Christ, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And probably in your apartment, when AT&T says it's too old to put in uh, uh, Internet, right? Uh, yeah, they said something about a wiring or something. It's not gonna, they said that they can put it in, but it's going to be not much faster than dial-up. So they're getting $3,000 a month for a studio yeah. in this older apartment house? Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing. That's amazing. And what I, were you paying for your place? When you, I was you left paying, here? and when I left, one, I had two apartments. One I was paying, I think, 1800 a month, and the other one I was paying 2300 a month, something like that. Okay. Uh, uh, a lot of money then. Well, uh, was I paying 2300 I can't remember. I think it was 2300 I think the other one was like 1200 or something. The whole thing came to about uh, 3800 a month, but the, for two apartments. Yeah. Okay. Now you and get one. And, and one of those apartments for a while was being paid off by the company in Sacramento because I used it as the office, as the studio. Right. So they paid the rent on that. So, but uh, even at 2300 was it 2300 or was it less? It might have been less than that. I think it was less. Yeah. I think it was like 1800 or something. But anyway, 
uh, it it uh, it was uh, you know I mean uh, now I would say it's going for four thousand oh, easily, easy easily you know so I mean that's the way things are in San Francisco overly expensive towns I can't afford to move back into you yeah know? I know a girl that lives in Noe Valley she's a lawyer and she's got she's got rent control she's paying three thousand and they want to kick her out because the units are going for five thousand oh boy. Oh boy! Well, they would love. They hope you die. Yeah, well, probably will. What are you paying? A thousand, something like that? You tell me. Um, no, half that. Five hundred? Yeah, a little more. Five hundred and a studio. Good. You've got a studio too. In that yeah. apartment is now going for three thousand. Oh, I'd be surprised if they were wouldn't come and try and kill you in your sleep. <laughs> hey, we've run out of time. <laughs> and I've run out of life. You know, so my, my wife, my ex-wife, let me say this quickly. You know, my ex-wife, Ronnie, has cancer and she's dying. Okay, she be they give her about two years. Okay. Ooh. And the last, I do an interview with her every two weeks, right? So a couple of weeks ago, I said to her, well, your time's up. And I went, wait a minute, that's not what we want to say, is it? But she has a good sense of humor about it. So Anyway, thanks, bubs. Thanks, Alex. Larry Bubbles Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. And that, of course, was the famous, fabulous Larry Bubbles Brown. If you live in the San Francisco Bay Area or uh, its environs and you see that he's playing somewhere, go see him. He's really, he's one of the funny, he's one of the funniest human beings I know, Okay capable of being hilarious, all right? Okay, hey, listen, uh, we have good news for you tonight. Uh, Phil isn't going to be here. This is another Phil-free night uh, because he's uh, coming back from his carpet convention. So, uh, you know, it's feel free to call, feel free, <laughs> feel free to call uh, and uh, be a part of our citizens panel where you can get a word in edgewise because Phil isn't going to be here tonight again. Uh, and, uh, last night he couldn't uh, do the show cause he was seeing his mother wherever he was. And, uh, tonight he's traveling back to the San Francisco Bay area. So it's all clear. All right. So give us a call. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I got to open up the, I, you can't call me unless I open up the lines, the, uh, Skype lines. Is it, is it proper to say, call me when I'm using Skype or is it just Skype me and we'll leave it at that. Okay. Anyway, uh, if you don't know how to get to us via Skype, just go over to gabnet.net. You won't miss any of this because the video is playing over there as well. <laughs> and uh, it, on the right-hand side of the page, it tells you how to get Skype, how to use Skype, how to call us on Skype, uh, and uh, uh, it'll make it really easy for you. It's like a tutorial. Uh, I, I, you know, one night I've got, what I've got to do on this show one night is to try and encourage new people to call because I really want to encourage new people to call. Not that I don't like the ones I've got, but it's, it's always nice to have a nice, well-rounded uh, group of people calling. And, uh, so to encourage them, maybe I'd have like, you know, a, a newbie night or something where only newbies would be allowed to call or something like that. But then that would be unfair to the people who call this program all the time. And I get great enjoyment out of them calling. So whatever you, anyway, the viewership has gone down precipitously since we had bubs on. So I'm glad for that. All right. And then I guess it went down because people went, Oh, well, Phil isn't going to be here. Well, I just, and I don't even want to listen to that. But anyway, the lines are open and we're ready to go. And it's another night where I don't know. I've got a. I've, I've been taking this drug called gabapentin, which a lot of you know of because a lot of people use it. Uh, uh, Tom Amaguchi says I want to hear new people too. Well, you know, you call only once in a great while, like when uh, Phil isn't here. That you're kind of a new person whenever you call, Tom. Uh, so uh, give us a call. Uh, Anyway, uh, this gabapentin, I, you know, it, it's for, I, I got this numbness in the feet and then the feet kind of hurt and everything. So my doctor said, try this stuff. Well, I had tried it before and I felt it only exacerbated the problem, but I tried it again and it is working. 
but I'm, I, I'm lightheaded all the time from this shit. And I take just very little of it. I'm not taking the required amount uh, that he would like me to take, but it, uh, it's just like I, I'm, I'm just drowsy all day. Uh, or I, I feel good, and then all of a sudden I feel undrowsy. Oh, hey, from Plano, Texas, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the state that almost elected Beto O'Rourke. Oof. Yeah, almost. Uh, there he is, Scott Boddicker, ladies and gentlemen. It you know, was close. It was close. Hey, you know something? Yeah. It hasn't been that close in years, has it? That's right. That's right. That's right. He, he. Uh, you know, two hundred thousand votes. Much out of, uh, I don't know how many it was, but yeah. Yeah. What are you rubbing against that made all that noise? Uh, is I had some kind of like a. It was like a rubbing sound or something across your my, microphone. It couldn't have been my microphone. It's it, it's on the it's yeah. on the uh, oh, well. it's on the thing. Hey. And my dog made a sound, but I, it didn't sound that loud. Really? Was that like a dog fart or something like that? You know, groaned over there. He's he's just uh, you know. Yeah, but anyway, anyway, I mean, I was I was really happy with the whole Beto O'Rourke thing because, in spite of the fact he didn't win. To come that close in Texas and be a lefty is is pretty uh, pretty good. Yeah, he's he's kind of left. He's 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 a little more you know middle of the road kind of guy. Well, but, I think he's where he's got to be to get elected in Texas. Yeah, he he, he yeah. had to talk middle of the road stuff. Yes, you're right. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it uh, seemed like a good guy, and I'm sure you voted for him. Oh, uh, of course I did. Yeah, and uh, you know, he, he could run for president. I don't care. Yeah. He, he, uh, yeah. You know, it's like Abraham Lincoln did, right? Abraham Lincoln lost his bid for the uh, Senate to uh, Douglas, wasn't Douglas. it? I don't think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Then he, then he went in, yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, what the hell? Hello there, Rob. How are you? Good. I'm real good. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just, you know, I'm gabapentin loopy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what it is? As you get older, they give you drugs. And they don't care what it does to you because they figure, ah, you're old. What what does it matter if you're a little loopy all the time? Well, it yeah. does matter, you know. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know what if what if this new pill doesn't allow you to get a heart on any longer? You don't need it. You know, <laughs> that's what you have to look forward to, kids who are listening to me as you get older. Doctors who just go, you know, he's gonna. They they stopped giving colonoscopies after after seventy five and you know what their reasoning is, if you got the cancer that day, that you got it at seventy five, if it suddenly got you, it'd be ten years before you got it, and you'll probably be dead by then. That's their theory, you know. So yeah, that's it's not so far fetched if you think about well, it. Well, it, it it wait till you get to be my age, and it sounds very far fetched because you don't want somebody saying, "Hey, look, we don't need to give you a colonoscopy. You're not going to live that long anyway." Well, and I also think it's not just it's not a, it's not completely that. Some of it is there's a risk factor at any time you go under any kind of anesthesia, so the risk factors at a certain point outweigh, you know, the actual. Uh, yeah, the benefit of the of the procedure. Well, you know, for prostate, they give you a PSA test so that if you get prostate cancer, they can find out or you know. And, and there's a question as to whether it's a good test or whether it works or not. But they stop giving them. It's recommended to stop giving them at 75 because the uh, the panic that would give somebody if he has an elevated PSA compared to the you know results. They say it's so slow growing at that age. Uh, you'll be dead before. Well, suppose I live to be a hundred, and now I've got prostate cancer. What are you going to do about it? You know. Well, my mother lived to be a hundred, and she had prostate cancer. Did, no, I'm just no, kidding. She no, she did. No. That would have been a medical miracle. Yeah, yeah. Well, my mother was a medical miracle. A hundred years old. That's incredible. She lived that long. People say, well, how do you, why do you think she lived that long? What did she do? I said, she wanted to get even with me, <laughs> you, you know, uh, because you, you as, a, uh, as a child then have to take care of that 100-year-old parent who at hardly what age even, did that happen? What, at what age did care needed to be administered? I, it happened around 
um, around 95, 96. Oh, that's, I was that's very, good. I was very lucky that way. And part of the reason was, is that I was, uh, you could call me a bad son, but I think I was kind of a good son in that I let her pretty much take care of herself. In other words, I, she still was going to the grocery store and getting groceries and lugging them back, you know, uh, and, and it wasn't like I was fawning over her and it gave her a great sense of independence. And I think that's why she lived to be a hundred. I think, Kids who who fawn over their parents as they get older and are just there every minute, rather than let them be self sufficient, are, are killing their parents. Does that sound reasonable? Well, I see what's going on with my mother, who's eighty eight. Yeah, and it's been a year and a half now that it's been more than two years that she hasn't been able to drive anymore. We took the license away, so that makes her because she doesn't live in a city. That makes her dependent on somebody. She needs to get around. She needs to go shopping. Um, and so she needs someone to take her. Right. And then after that, it becomes an issue of, well, now her now she's getting dementia. And so she can't even make a shopping list anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, you know, she loses her ability to cook. And so, you know, it's not a matter of doting. It's a matter of <laughs> assessing every time you see her. That we're thinking this this is going to be the last Christmas that she's going to be living on her own. Yeah, well, it's not going to be this way next year. You know no what? Way. You know what happened uh, with my mother? Um, she, you ever hear this thing about uh, oh, and the old lady broke her hip and then she died? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you absolutely. go, how do people die from a broken hip? And the answer is, I I began to see the answer. What happened was she broke her hip at. I, she, at, at 95 she didn't fall down or anything the hip just said that's enough and it collapsed on itself so they then put her in the hospital and they put a pin in there and they rebuilt the hip and everything was fine all right there was no reason why she couldn't walk it's just that she had to learn how to walk again that she had to take it easy and she had to use a walker a little bit and we couldn't teach her to do that because her dementia yeah. was so prominent. So yeah. consequently, she had this $1,000, $10,000 hip and uh, could not walk again. So that meant that we had to institutionalize her, you know, and we first put her in this one place. It was just terrible, but it was the one thing we could uh, uh, do. And then we found, we managed to get her into the Harvard of old folks homes called the Jewish uh, Home for the Aged in San Francisco. And that place was wonderful, just wonderful. I was so lucky to get her in there. And we simply gave them all her money, and they kept spending her money every month until it ran out. And when it ran out, they had a policy that nobody ever gets kicked out of the Jewish home for the ages. So that's how that was taken care of. And uh, uh, she stayed there for, I think, about five years, you know. And uh, uh, But, I mean, after that hip incident... Her cognitive stuff went south and, you know, it was one of those kind of things where, yeah, she recognized me. You know, that wasn't the problem. Uh, yeah, they, they're living in a dream world. My mother will tell me that she was, she's, I was with my mother all day today. We ran around. Oh, we were oh. in Brooklyn. My mother hasn't been in Brooklyn in 30 years. My grandmother's been dead for more than 30 years, but my mother was with her all day. You know what was terrible? Well, so I, you know, what I was doing is I had a, my mother in the hospital. Uh, I uh, didn't have a job, and I was trying to get a job, and I, I had to go back and forth between San Francisco and go to New York for like three, four months at a time. Uh, and so uh, I told my mother, I said, Mom, I won't be around for a while because I've got to go to New York. And she said, well, when you're there, say hello to my mother and my father. Yeah, well, there you go. Same thing. That's what my mother Well, I made a big mistake. I said, Mom, your mother and father are dead. And she went into a state as though yep. it was the first time she had found out her parents were dead. Yep. Doesn't pay to mention it. it. You just don't mention it. Yeah, I'll say hello to them. 
But mm. but I didn't know that at the time. You know, I figured, oh, you just tell her, hey, your parents, oh, yeah, my parents are dead. No, that wasn't it. She went, my parents are dead? Yeah, we've all done that. I mean, and, and once in a while it slips out because you, you just don't think about it. She'll say something and, and, and then you say something and you could see you. They just complete. It's like they're hearing it for the first time. Well, I felt bad because I I didn't go back for about four months, and then I went back. And of course, the first thing I'm going to do is go see my mother. And when she saw me, it was like uh, I had visited her two days ago. She didn't she didn't know that I had not been coming to see her. Right. You know. Same uh, thing with my mother. She thinks I just. She keeps asking me, "How do I like Virginia?" Ma, I've been here 11 years. Where have I been? No way. Yeah, ma, I moved here in 2007. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 That I tell her. I mean, we don't mention people who die anymore. Yeah. But I, you know, I will say, Ma, no, I've been here 11 years now. Let's see. I'm trying to add Jeff to the group. I can't add him to the group. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> don't tell me I'm going to have this problem again tonight. Oh, boy. Uh, let me see here. Uh, what do I do? Let me stop. Let me go over to Jeff's name here. Let me go add to group call. Call Skype. Let me call him and see if we can get him in this way. Uh, if you're listening, Jeff, we're calling you uh, on Skype. Uh, nah, that's not going to work. Oh, wait a minute. I think he may be. Are you there, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Okay, turn on your uh, turn on your camera. Okay. Okay, I was having some trouble answering the the line for you. Maybe we're going to have that trouble tonight and you know, Skype is going to fuck me over, in which case I'll hang up and have all of you call again. I was about to reset it. I'm going to do that again. Did you turn on your camera? Yeah, I tried. And it won't turn on. No, so I'm going to try calling me right back. Try calling me right back. Yeah. Yeah, we may have to just stop Skype and start it all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, anyway, so you know that was that was the you know the, the problem with my mother, uh, which was uh, you know when you have to deal with a parent that age, it's not easy because uh, you don't know what to do. You know you don't know what's proper. Uh, you don't know when to correct them on stuff, and also it's uh, it's it's painful to watch, you know, because uh, here's this person who has always been okay. Now let's see, see, I, there, oh, there we go. Okay, it's yeah. working now. It's working now. Okay, um, that's Jeff Stein, everybody. Just in case you were wondering who the hell that lovely bearded man is, oh, man. Oh, that's a great beard. It's a great beard. I work on it. Yeah, I keep trying to grow a beard like that, and I can't because I just it's just like here it gets all kind of just blotchy. Mm -hmm. um, so you're very you're very lucky. I work on it. Yeah, but I trip a lot. Yeah, uh, you know, but having to deal with a parent who who you know you wish your parents would live forever, but then they do, and then that becomes the problem. You know, when my mother re my mo mother reached a hundred. Uh, she got to a point where she, what was it that happened? She just kind of refused. She stopped eating. She didn't want to yeah. eat. She stopped that's, eating. That's the end. Yeah. That's, uh, that, you know, palliative care. When we, when my father, that that's what they said. They said, when they stop eating, that's their body shutting down. You know, they don't want to eat. They, you know, we, my father tried. We brought him his favorite things and he's, he's like, yeah. Well, she it. was just, she was just, I mean, she died of old age is what she died yeah. of. She didn't die yeah. of cancer. She didn't die of a disease. She died of old age. She didn't even have, she had dementia. She didn't have Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's will kill you. Yes. Dementia won't. Uh, but uh, I remember I was, <laughs> it's strange, I was in Macy's shopping and the, my cell phone rings and it's my business manager, Gary, and he's got on the line the, her, her doctor and says, look, we can't get her to eat. She just won't eat. She doesn't want to eat. There's nothing wrong with her. She just won't eat. Now, we can either keep, we can feed her intravenously and keep feeding her through tubes, you know, forcing food into her, or we can just let her go. The call is up to you. 
And it was kind of like, it was no different than the time that some my <laughs> veterinarian called me and said, we're going to have to put your dog to sleep. You know? Yeah, I know, it's weird. Yeah, it's very weird, but I just said, yeah, sure, you know. Because I thought about it, and I said, a hun- over 100 years old, you know, I be- how lucky was I? Or how cursed was I? One or the other, you know. Uh, and uh, she outlived my father by 41 years. Wow, wow. Well, the whole know? other life. And I, I, I adored my father. I often said, why couldn't he have gone at 100 instead of her, you know. But Anyway, so... And then because he did what hell he'd had to put himself through if he'd have lived that long. And, and you know when they die that old, like if your mother, your mother's eighty-eight, right? Yeah. And let's yeah. say she died tomorrow, and there's always that possibility, right? Sure. Would you feel bad, or how would you feel? Because oh, yeah, I mean, I would feel bad, of course. Uh, my mother, she has no more personality, but she's still my mother. And when I go see her, I'll see her next week. Yeah. Um, She's still this woman that if you never met her and didn't talk a lot with her, yeah, you wouldn't know there's anything wrong with her because right. she's still spry and she moves faster than I do. Yeah, She's still got a body. Her body is in such great shape in terms of her able – She, I, I watch her because we have the cameras in her house now. She bends down, picks stuff up from the floor. She gets up. She runs up down the stairs. I mean it's crazy. It's, it's just her mind. So, yeah, I would, I mean, I will miss her, obviously, but I, I did that with my father. I, I, I said, you know, I was blessed to have him until I was, you know, in my, 55 years old. Yeah. And yeah. I have great memories of my father. And so that's how I comforted myself when it was. Well, you know, I did not feel, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't crying sad, okay, uh, because my mother went at 100. Yeah, and you, you can't cry. And you hundred. can't cry over that. You know, you no. just can't cry over that. Um, I remember crying over my father who died at 59. Ah, uh, it's young. You know, I mean, I, uh, I rem- uh, you know, that was devastating to me. But my mother at 100, I just went, you know, she lived a long life, longer than most people are allowed to have. And w- right. why should why should I feel sorry? I should feel happy. You know, I should feel happy that... Uh, she, there was nothing more to live for, you know, she was, right. had dementia so badly that, you know, although I got to tell you this story, I love this story. I, I've told it several times before, so don't stop me if you've heard it. Uh, she was in this, in, in, in the old Jewish old folks home, she was in the dementia ward and they had this day room where all the old ladies and old men sat around all day just rotting away basically i mean there was you know they'd do whatever they could to keep them happy and it was a great place and you know there were 300 people working there and 300 people institutionalized there so it was wow. a, you know it was really I- I- intensively good all right but so you got this day room there just to tell you you know when women want to complain about guys Try not to snort as much, uh, Brian. It's, it's mm. distracting. Uh, uh, I don't mean to insult you, but you you sounds like you have a cold or something. Do you? I don't know what the fuck's going on. Cocaine. Uh, cocaine. Yeah. I wish. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, Can't they, afford it. in this room, I look around. There were no men. There's one guy. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, for all the women say about a guy's this, guy's this, guys are lucky, guys rule the world. Yeah, you outlive them. You know, women. And so in this room, nothing but women, one guy. And I'm thinking, you know, if I were that one guy and this were years ago, this would be like going to heaven. (laughs) But, But at that age, it's not right. And he would sit around and he would play the piano all day long for them. And he was very good, you know. There's certain things that like as you get older you don't forget. You could forget your your son, your daughter, your whole life, what you did. But when it comes to playing the piano, it's just something you know how to do. So he would play the piano all day. And I would walk around this room and I would go to see my mother and so on. And there was this one woman that every time I went in there, 
would look at me and go, you a cop? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I go, no, I'm, I'm not a cop. Okay. You sure you're not a cop? <laughs> and every time I would go there, I'd walk past her and she'd go, you a cop? Never could figure that one out. Probably knew a cop that looked like you. and There was, some, there was something in her demented little mind that thought I was a cop. You know, I, I it's often one of the wondered what would places to be. What would happen if I said, yes, I am, <laughs> you know, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's strange. It's really strange. But, you know, I mean, if you get that old, you need that kind of help. If you're lucky, you know, you can stay. I don't know that I consider that lucky. Well, I don't. Yeah, want to I see that what way. you mean. I'd rather go out in a blaze. Well, so would I, well, I'd rather just go like, like that. I don't ever I'm want. Feeling in my sleep. I don't want to ever die. So you know. Yeah. See, I don't have that. I don't have that. Uh, that burning desire that I've got to live forever. Yeah. And I have. I Rob, I guarantee you, will have a less less of a desire to live than you do, especially if oh, I, I at thirty six have the shitty economy to look forward to. And all that. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to die, but I I I, I am not. Um, I I don't have that. I mean, if I were to die in my sleep tonight so be it i have a great but if i have the end of the american empire to look forward to in the next 10 years if not the next five <laughs> i'd rather be dead tomorrow oh hope, no hope i've, still, I've hope is still alive I, I, uh, tim has just joined us i would actually want to be around for the end of this uh, this country uh, you know i would like to see the downfall and see what goes on Maybe for the and first have a, six and months. And have one more citizen panel with Phil and say, I told you so. Yeah, <laughs> maybe for the first six months. And then after that, Alex is going to be ill. As, lo as long as it's just like the movie, the end. Well, you know something? I got to tell you. I got to tell you with my, I'm uh, thinking Mad Max. With, with my ex-wife, Ron Ronnie, because she's facing that. You know, she's facing, she has about two years to live, basically. That's at the outset. And the first thought that came to her mind when she told me about this was, you know, my what I'm pissed off at is I'll never get to see how the Trump thing turns out. Yeah, no, that's that's a you know, that's an interesting reaction to that. Mine is I'll, ne I'll never get to see a uh, season th would be I'll never get to see season 13 of Doctor Who. You know, right. every, everybody has different priorities. But um, no, that was the first thought she had. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll never be able to uh, uh, find out what happens to Trump. Is she an atheist? Uh, is she an atheist? I, uh, yeah, basically. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, and I that bothers her. So listen, that doesn't bother I, me. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I wish that I were, I wish I were God fearing. Okay, I wish I were God fearing, because then I would have no fear of death. I would go. Oh, I'm going to be with all. I'm going to be with your uncle Bill. You know, I'm going to be with Grandma so and so. But you're too well rounded and intelligent to be God fearing. Yes. So my alternative to being God fearing is having fear of death. Because what is religion anyway? The whole thing boils down to giving you a story about how life is going to be better after you live here. Yeah, but is oblivion bad or is it? good and that it brings about an eternal peace that you are no longer cognitively aware you are in either way peace or misery well, you're no longer cognitively aware of either uh, you know See, I, I i i i compartmentalize the whole thing i i think organized religion is is uh, uh from my perspective a joke yeah but i believe in <clears throat> i believe in an afterlife you're and i believe that and i believe that there is a um a greater power, who, I don't know what you call him, who he is, but I do believe that at some point we're all going to be reunited again. I believe that. Okay. And maybe well, I believe that because uh, it makes me feel good. But here's my question. If there is an afterlife, what was there before we were born? Yeah. Well, if you're, an, if, if you're of, uh, what is it, Buddhist, they believe in reincarnation so that there's this pool yeah, but there's of, gotta be, of life force. That was Hinduism. And, yeah, but there's got to be whatever. some. There's a couple of them that believe there's that. Gotta be <laughs> some, there are, There's got to be some place where you never existed. Like my, when, I, when, my fa when I asked my father once, I said, I have this great fear of dying. And he said, why? And I said, I, I, just, this, I don't understand what it's like to not exist. And he said, you've been there before. 
<laughs> you know, and and then I started worrying about what that was like. You know, like how could I have exi- not existed, and then all of a sudden I exist. You know, it's kind of like existence is something you get very used to, and you can't comprehend anything else. And that's where religion came in because a bunch of con artists years ago figured, I think I know a way I can make money. I will <laughs> preach to these people and give them a a, 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 a feeling of, of relief that they're going to go somewhere else. And if they just put money in the pot every week, they're going to go there, you know? And I have a, hmm? I have a good friend who's, who's Jewish and he is... He is learned enough about it that he speaks uh, um, Hebrew. Mm. He studied it. Mm. Yeah. He knows a lot about the religion, and he's not religious. But what he loves about Judaism and going to temple and doing all of that, when I asked him, was like, if you're not religious, then why do you do it? He goes, community. <clears throat> he loved the oh, community oh, oh, of it. Uh, that, uh, yeah, but I don't think that that's why most people are drawn to religion. Well, most people don't like being alone. Most people are drawn to religion so. out of the fear of death and knowing that there's a better place beyond this. And in, if they're living in misery, like they're <laughs> poverty-stricken, they even become more religious because that, that, that gives them a feeling of relief. So my question is, for people who are going, well, you know, religion is the opiate of the people and religion is terrible, and I'm one of those people— is it not maybe good for some people who don't have anything to be able to believe even in something false? Well, think about what you're saying. If, if it's a, if it's if kind it of helps. like Lamaze, you can focus your your energy and, and thoughts in one certain direction that it's like a painkiller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, Brian. It's, it's an yeah. opiate, opiate of the people, in a sense. Yeah. Well, to dovetail with what Tim is saying, I'd say that it's uh, not only like a painkiller, but it's like giving a hallucinogenic uh, painkilling uh, substance to somebody who's uh, in chronic pain and schizophrenic. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not so f- out of it that I don't think that, as Rob put it, there may be something beyond this. Uh, because there is so little we truly know about the universe. Uh, and there's too, too much, too much, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not one who's going to, who, who I believe that people have special abilities to be able to keep in contact with these, with, with these people, with these spirits. And, and, and how would, how would they know the kinds of things that they know? I've, I mean, you've been in radio for how many years? You, you must've come across some psychic that you've worked with don't believe um, in them don't believe in them see i do see i mean i mean i mean in I, fact I, I made a rule on my radio show to never book psychics <laughs> i believe in them i i've because i've i've dealt with three in my career that i had a you know i didn't book them but i was told they're going to be on your show once a week or whatever and you're going to take calls and then you're going to play music and then you're going to go back to the calls and and these people told me things that there is no freaking way in hell that they're going to know. Well, I used to Where have, are they getting this I from? used to have a guy mm-hmm. on, uh, a psychic on regularly. Uh, and the reason I quit having him on is uh, one day he, I, I said, well, let me, uh, let me read your mind. Let me be psychic with you. And I became psychic. And then callers would call and I would become a psychic with them. And he was amazed. He said, you have amazing psychic abilities. And I said, no, I don't. I'm using the same phony tricks you're using. They call it cold reading? Well. It was a South Park episode. I, 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 I did this a couple, many times on the air. I said, call me up and I'll read your mind. You know. And I was about 90% correct on stuff. But the reason I was doing it is while you're talking to people, there are tells. And you can pretty much, you can say things that are nebulous enough that they'll go, oh, wow, and that gives you a clue to something else. Like, I'll give you an example. There was this guy named Peter Herkos. He supposedly claims he's the guy that caught the Boston Strangler. 
which was a famous murderer up in, well, of all places, Boston. What are the co what's the coincidence of that? You know, the Boston <laughs> Strangler being from Boston. And Peter Herkos came on my show and he started reading my mind. And he said, uh, I, I see you married. And I go, well, no, I'm not married. And he says, no, but I see you married. So, see, either way he would have been correct, okay? And that's the way psychics work. What they do is they throw stuff out, they judge your response, and then they, they pretty much are wheedling stuff out of you without you knowing it. And so, I, I just never liked, no, I, the reason I didn't like psychics, I wouldn't have them on, is because I felt they harmed people rather than helped them and they calmed them. That's a, that's a common trick of magicians also, where they where you get a, a numerical result and you have a choice between the two and whatever the guy whatever your dupe picks, you say yeah, but the opposite is this number and you just go down the path and you can get to any conclusion well, and know what and know the final answer by just a little pathway. Like magicians that. have tons of tricks. One of one of the most the best of them is that uh, uh, it's it's a thing. Uh, called forcing a card you don't know you say, pick a card any card but you're being forced right. a card you know right uh but uh i just i just felt that too many people were relying on these psychics like i considered uh, for instance i'll give you a good example remember uri geller mm -hmm. yes guy bent spoons yeah. oh and they had the uh the uh People here in America, like the CIA, wanted to interview him and see how he could bend those spoons and things like that. And yeah. Penn Gillette told me once, he said, the problem with Uri Geller was he'd be okay if he said, listen, I'm a magician and this is a trick. But he right. didn't say it was a trick. He said he James was... James Randi debunked him. Oh, J James Randi uh, went right after him, yeah. And, I love and, that guy. And nailed him good. I knew Randy. Good guy. But so you put you it put them like... in the category of, as the WWE, basically wrestlers. Well, no, what now? Nah, it, it's more like uh, he what what he was doing. Uh, Penn said the problem with what Randy was what not Randy was doing with what uh, Uri Geller was doing was he was claiming he had this power when what he was doing was doing a magic trick. And that's fine if you want to do it as a magic trick. But if you say, I really can do this, and then you're letting people like the CIA interview you and be amazed by what you can do in bending spoons, and you must have some kind of psychic mind that can help the government, you know, and then you don't say, hey, look, guys, cool it. I'm just a magician. This is a trick. And he said that's what bothered him is he never said it was a trick. And that's what always bothered me about psychics. They're really wrong most of the time uh and and they the people believe in them so much that they give them their money and you know the, uh, a lot of these evangelists the faith healers and stuff you know a good, a good example of, uh, that's another form of being a psychic really because they go out there and they go uh you've got a mother who's dying blah 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 you know so I, I just never wanted to be part of that. That's, but you believe psychics do exist, right, Rob? So I had um, my first wife. We were engaged. It may have been a little bit before we were engaged. She calls me up one night. I was working nights mm -hmm. at the time. She calls me up and she says, I just got back from a psychic. Now, this is a person they had never seen before. Uh -huh. And the person... Uh, her mother, she and her mother went, my fiance and my ex-mother-in-law went. Yeah. And um, she says to me, is your father okay? And I said, yeah, why? Well, the psychic said, your father's going to have a problem. I'm like, how did, he, how did my father come up? She says, I don't know, just, you know, I told him I was engaged. And he said, you better watch your father-in-law's stomach. I was like, yeah, I don't believe in this crap, you know, right? Well, within two months, my father was in the hospital, had his gallbladder removed. <clears throat> okay, and, you, and what if, know, wait a minute, look, what if, let me th posture this to you, uh, uh, Rob. What if 
He didn't wind up in the hospital in two months. You would have forgotten that this guy even That's said correct. this. You're mm -hmm. right. You're 100 percent right. I would have forgotten it. Yeah. But there have been many other times in my life where a psychic has told me something and I disregarded it and it came to fruition. That's what I mean. It's like, yeah, 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 sure. The first psychic I ever met was back in 1979 at this radio station I worked. And he told me all this shit about my career and things that were going to happen. And he was, it was only one thing he wasn't right on. He, he described my girlfriend to a T. Yeah. But he said I was going to marry her. And I did, I, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. But, okay. but I asked him about my career. <laughs> I said, you yeah. know, I'm new in this business. It's 1979. I was working at my first radio station in Florida. Yeah. And he, and I asked him straight up, you know, um, what's coming from my career? He said, I see a change for you. He said, I see, I see, I, all I see is a wall of tape machines and you sitting in front of this wall of tape machines. And I had hey, no... Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Yeah. C can I uh, file a brief uh, as a friend of the court? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Mich Michio Kaku is the famous celebrity physicist. Yes. Uh, and at, at the level of Stephen Hawking, he s says that there is the order is so precise in the universe of you know how of how everything's designed down to the atom that it had to be designed by a, some intelligent being. Now, what you know, it just wouldn't happen at random. But what does, so, that, what does that have to do it, with what we're saying about it, science? Well, it just says that could, there's most probable some other... Imagine where we're going to be at a thousand years from now. The technology is ballooning. We can't even imagine what it... We can't even do sci-fi yeah, that's going to yeah, really know yeah, what's going to happen in a thousand years. Well, that, well, but getting back to what Rob was saying. Hello, Chris Ritter, by the way. We haven't seen Chris in a while. Is, are you in, uh, in Nevada? Yes, I'm in uh, By the Nevada. way, congratulations to Nevada electing a dead person. I really, I really think yeah, that uh, that's... Uh, he dropped your name, and that was the difference. So. <laughs> hey, Alex. I just realized, just saw something. Apparently, you can mute other callers. I, I'm clicking on... Uh, no offense, uh, Mr. Ritter, right? I don't know if I forget his first name, but uh, I was just, just playing around with the controls. I clicked on the... Uh, circle and it's given me the option you know mute and remove from call as a as a, from my end so maybe yeah. it's something you could explore oh, I, from your uh, end well, every time phil well, runs his no, mouth no i'm not i can't do it because i'm not using the same skype you're using okay i'm using the old skype i don't want to use the new skype well uh, it would be a net uh, when you if, if you ever come to come around in the new skype apparently that's a new feature that they added you can mute well when he starts running his mouth over someone else, or even when I do, he can mute us. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I, I don't want to use the new Skype. I really. I didn't don't. mean to interrupt. I just thought that was. It, no, it, make, it makes it that. makes it look terrible. But anyway, uh, you know, when it comes when we're talking about uh, uh, so psychics, you know, all I'm saying is Rob that. Uh, uh, to begin with, if somebody says, "What's going to happen with my career?" He knew that there was going to be a room full of tapes. Well, so what, so what happened you was, so this is like February of that year, right? Yeah. And I, here I am, I'm in your, your 1979-style radio station with turntables and cart machines and, yeah. and a microphone and a big console, and I'm, you know, and so he, we're talking in that room, right? And then he says to me, I, I see a change, and all I see is this big wall of tape machines and you there. He said, I don't know what it means, I don't know what it is. Well... Fast forward three months, about approximately. Yeah. The company buys the radio station, yeah. takes the takes the FM station and makes it a automated rock station, <laughs> and takes me off the air on the AM and makes me the production director on the FM and gives me a board op shift on the automation. And I was sitting there babysitting this. And it's funny because I said it the same way he did. I was on the phone with a friend of mine and I was looking for another job. Yeah. And I said to him, I'm sick and tired of sitting here look behind this wall, in front of this wall of tape machines. And I stopped and I went, holy crap, wall of tape machines. Well, you know, uh, 
I'm trying to think what's the, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, there have been a bunch of those things that have happened in my life are re revolving around psychics. And I just believe that there are energies. There are, there's sensitivities that people have to certain energies well, that they are sensitive to that. I have never in my life seen proof of that. Okay. Uh, to be honest with you. So nobody has blown your mind with anything they've ever no, said. To you. No, no. Uh, the day that Peter Herko they, said to me, are. I see you married, and I said, I'm not, and he said, yeah, but I see you married, uh, I went, these guys are phonies. And I've never found one who proved to me that they were for real or that they, you know, they, 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 they what they do is they say things that are kind of nebulous. Like, let me say, you're in this room full of tapes, Okay. Now, the guy knew that you were broadcasting, obviously, because you were interviewing him on the air, right? No, we were off talking off the air. No, but I'm saying he, you talked to him in a radio station. This is yes, what, we were at what a radio you, station. What you did for a living. And he right. said, I, you're, you're going to be in a room full of tape machines. Well, that could have meant anything. And when you finally, months later, found yourself in a room full of tape machines, well, oh, my God, that guy was right. But that guy wasn't taking a bad stab at it, you know, because anything, what would have constituted a room full of tape machines? Three tape machines? Five tape machines? He said a wall of tape machines. My wife and, claims. And I use the exact same term, wall of tape machines. Hello, My wife claimed to me after, after we were married yeah. that she was told that when she went to a psychic with her and her mother that I was going to marry her. And I didn't even know her. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't believe her. <laughs> now, now, Mike, here's my question. If you didn't marry her, she would have never remembered that psychic. She never. Uh, she I don't never, know. She went no. there a few times, she said. No, and, then, and then later, after we were married, she told me the whole story about how she was going to. Yeah, but no, no I don't but, know. Maybe, maybe if, so. If you didn't marry her, she never would have said that psychic's full of shit. You get what I'm so saying? You're saying yeah. just got lucky. You're saying all of these things. I'm saying are just, that you're if you spit out enough things, eventually some of them are going to be right. You spit out enough yeah, things. Yeah, could be. You spit out enough things, and then when they come true, you go, "Oh, that psychic was amazing." Or but, some big. But guy when it doesn't happen, when it doesn't happen, <laughs> you don't sit around going, "That psychic was full of shit." You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it was, it, yeah. Was, it was pretty coincidental the way she told me. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's just it was, random though. My father's going to have a problem with his stomach. I'm in a wall of tape machines. Another one. The last psychic I worked with in the '90s told me that we were doing a show, and I was, you know, I was the host, and she was the guest in another studio. And during the records, I would answer the phones and and put people on hold and get their names and their birth dates and stuff so that we could line up a bunch of callers for the segment. And I was talking to this one woman and I was like, Hmm, I'm really, you know, this, this, this woman sounds kind of cool and I'm interested, you know, maybe in talking to her a bit more. So at the end of the night, um, I had kept her phone number and stuff, right? Cause we would, you know, we carried right. on for a bit on the phone. Right. And at the end of the night, um, I, I, we we're getting, we we're, you know, off the air and we we're walking out of the station together and, uh, we were talking and she, and I said to her, gee, you know, I, I think I'm going to call this and I remember her name anymore, but I think I'm going to call her and said to me, she said to me, what's her birth date again? And what's her, her, her age. And I told her and she said, trouble. I wouldn't mess with her I'm telling you, you're going to regret it. <laughs> and I regretted it. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't listen to her and I regretted it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, again, I always have had my, what can I call it, my doubts about this sort of thing. How about you, Chris? You ever dealt with a psychic or a fortune I, teller? Or? I work with uh, a lot of magicians, about 100 of them, and, and uh, some of them pretend. Um, I, I did learn one thing, though. Uh, you did? I was hanging out with a bunch of my wife's coworkers once. And one of them really made a big thing about a certain candy bar she loved. She just went crazy about it, and I just thought that was weird. Three, four years later, I ran into the same group again. They didn't remember meeting me, and I started acting. I was copying some of the magicians doing the cold readings, and I said, I have this image of you. You have this favorite candy bar. 
and I blew her mind. And then I cold read her a little more and I guessed two more things correctly. And all of a sudden I didn't like what happened. I got surrounded and they were, they were deifying me. And, and I guessed another thing, right. That I thought was pretty simple, simple minded, but they were going crazy at this party. They really thought I was legit psychic. And I kind of uh, explained my way out of it by saying, oh, I can only get the frequency. It's intermittent. It's like a radio transmitter. I don't, uh, now I don't have it. I can't predict, predict football games for you or give you stock tips. Yeah. <laughs> and the one thing I walked home thinking about that night was if anyone reasonable was psychic, they would not tell anyone. They would not open up to the public. And those people like Gene Dixon... And, and you, as you know, James Randi, he's kind of the he's setting the tone for the whole magic industry. Penn Jillette is kind of an acolyte. Yep. And, uh, and in fact, I, in fact Randy I, met, off- I met Randy through yeah. Penn. Good documentary on him. Yeah. And Randy's offered a million dollars to any psychic, and no one's ever collected. And uh, so either psych, it's all be it's all bullshit, or a real psychic would never want that notoriety. Well, you know, the, an honest liar. That's what it was called. Yeah, the, uh, documentary. the thing that uh, and I, you, you having worked with, you say, hundreds of magicians, mm-hmm. uh, did you ever know any of them that believed in in uh, uh, psychic powers? Maybe. Maybe really? one believes he he is a, a really nice guy. I can't tell if he believes in it or not, but he he's using the BS to really be nice to people and to give them faith. Uh, you know, I think he even tells Alzheimer's people what they want to hear, but, but he's oops. a super nice guy. He would never rip someone off. Right. But he's using, he's using that stuff to make people feel good about their lives and maybe to keep them from making but mistakes. I'm, I'm saying one of the reasons I don't think magicians in general yeah. are, are positive towards psychics is because yeah. they know the tricks. They know how it's done. You know, usually <laughs> uh, they usually. get fooled by other magicians, yeah. but yeah. By the way, Bree, did you ever go to a fortune teller or anybody like that? You know, not that I can remember. I, I think I did when I was in New Orleans one time. Yeah. And, yeah, I was just walking around one of the parts of the city. And I was with, actually, a woman from Tur- uh, Cyprus, Turkey. And I think she was a... a you know, of gypsy descent. And uh, I think she did it, and then I think I did it. But I, I, it's just a vague recollection of many years ago. Yeah. Uh, I certainly didn't put any weight into it. I, I just thought of it as a, well, this is just something we're doing. Like if we had walked past a, you know, dark chocolate ice cream soft serve, I would have got a dark chocolate ice cream soft serve. You know what I mean? Yeah. Tom Yamaguchi is written on our chat room. Alex is right. Psychics are con artists. And then he adds significant coincidence. Uh, and and uh, I think that goes back to what I was saying is that uh, you're going to remember those things that might have been said to you that uh, happened. But when they don't happen, you don't go, oh, that psychic was full of crap. You get what I'm trying yeah. to say here? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, and a lot of people will boys twist things it. around to make it fit what has been said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Plus, uh, you know, part of the art of uh, being a, uh, a psychic or playing a psychic is that you are intuitive and you're you're zeroing in on listening to what the people are replying to you and taking your cues from that and getting the next thing you say. Like, for instance, a good example, they caught the, uh, Randy. Now that we mentioned the, uh, Randy went and got uh, this uh, this uh, uh, preacher, what was his name, that, uh, that uh, I had, uh, what's his name, prank him. Uh, I had uh, um, uh, 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 Patrick prank him. I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. Uh, huh? Pop off. Yeah. Pop off. Uh, the way Randy got pop off was he found the frequency of the two way system that went into pop off's ear. <laughs> and his wife would go around the audience before they went on. And he would, she would listen in on conversations that people were having with each other. And they usually were like, well, I hope he, he can hear my grandmother. 
you know, or I hope he can hear my father, or I hope he can help me cure my whatever, you know. And then she would write all this shit down, then she would go upstairs with the transmitter, right, and then keep talking to his ear. The woman on your left has an aunt. Uh, her name is Margaret. Uh, she wants to know if she can, you can reach her. And then What's he would the go frequency? out and do this stuff. And what Randy did, he, and he showed this on The Tonight Show, he took the, 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 uh, the what do you call it, the, um, uh, the, the transmission and what she was saying to him in his ear and synced it up with the TV show where he was doing this stuff. And you could see that he was reacting to what she was telling him to do. So there are all kinds of tricks. I'm not saying that that's the way it happened with you, Rob, but in that particular case, that was just complete con artist. And believe it or not, Popoff's still in business. Yeah. Well, look, there are con artists who are financial planners as well, right? There yes. are con artists oh, in all yeah, games. Absolutely. absolutely. There's one in the White House right now. <laughs> there was a guy by the name of Bernie Madoff, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, Love that name, by the way. Huh? Love that name. Yeah, great Madoff. name. Great name. Made off with your money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Made off with the 1% money, most of them. Yeah. How about you, Tim? You ever, you ever had any experience with psychics or fortune tellers? Or? Yeah, when I was uh, a teenager, we went to a psychic church, and they they told my friend, they didn't tell me nothing, but they during the ceremony, they told my friend about an injury in a certain part of his back, from football a few years ago. Yeah. And we uh, weren't from the neighborhood. So yeah. when it happens, and all they do, once they get the hook in you, you start to believe in it all. But, I, you know, I, I'm pretty much on the fence. I think there's there's so much we don't understand, and I think there's a lot of charlatans, but I think there's some extremely intuitive people out there. Well, you it's know. The power of thought. It's the power of thought. I just know? don't you, think if you, you say it enough, you're going to believe it. I, I just don't no, think intuition if you, is different. Than I don't think if you really had that ability that you would want to make money off of it. You know, <laughs> that you would uh, that that uh, hey, give me a give me a dollar and I'll tell read your fortune. You know, uh, well, how about, well, but you, unless you're a sociopath, maybe. Well, yeah, uh, but we're not talking about Trump tonight. Anyway, uh, well, no, no, but no, but you have you have sociopaths in, in all work categories. Well, of course, of course, yes, you do. Uh, uh, Jeff, ever ever deal with anything psychic or have any anything psychic happen to you? No. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't hear your microphone because you don't You're have muted. it on. Um, I I'm too pragmatic. I, I I just don't. I don't believe in stuff that I don't believe in. <laughs> yeah, see, I've never had the guts to go put money down and go into one of those places. Neither have I. It's always yeah. been it's always been by happenstance. Yeah, I've never gone into a psychic. I've never given any money to do that. I just, I, you look at the place and you go, she's got a neon sign. Right. Card. Yeah, I know. You're and, right. And <clears throat> I'm not going to write a check for well, that. Well, uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a great story. My, my, I was doing. I was doing a TV show, it, and my friend Bobby Slayton was on it. And we did this bit where we took the cameras and we went through, uh, uh, through the streets of San Francisco, and him doing bits with people and things like that. And we passed by this, literally this psychic. A window fortune teller, you know, with the palm and the hand and the whole and the, yeah, window, yeah, yeah, the yeah. neon palm and all of that. And uh, on the front door was a sign that read "Out of Business." <laughs> and Slayton looked at me and went, "You would have thought she would have seen this coming." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, uh, I just, I just. I'm bothered by psychics only because a lot, most of them, uh, you know, if you want to say some people have some kind of ability, we can argue that. But most do, of them do you know, don't. Do you know who needs a psychic right now, Alex? Oh, it's going to be something to have to do with Trump. I just know that from you. Yeah. Well, no, no. The Florida <clears throat> Election Commission. Oh, the Florida Election Commission. Yeah, the yeah. one, Broward County, the, yeah, every Democratic county, were two minutes late getting it loaded to the website, so they, they rejected the vote in Broward County. That's bullshit, boy. I'll tell you, every vote should count. I agree. Well, well, let's 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 be honest. Florida is where Jews and democracy go to die. So, <laughs> no, 
No, it's just a purple state. It's a very purple. Well, it, it has turned into a purple state. It was a very red state at one point, but it's purple right. now. And because it's purple, these votes are so fucking close. It's ridiculous. I mean, yep, the, the Democrats picked up two more House seats today. Yep. Yep, we're up to 35 now. Now, here's, you know who was the psychic? Chris Matthews on MSNBC. He said... They're definitely, and this was early on. They're definitely good. the Democrats will win thirty to forty seats. Years ago, I was sitting at home watching uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson give a speech. He he was going to give a speech where Viet, about Vietnam, and so I'm sitting there and I'm watching him give the speech. There's no reason for me to even say this, but I looked at the person next to me and I said, "I bet before the speech is over." He's going to say he's not going to run for another term. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, at the end of that speech, he did exactly that. Now, am I psychic? Or is that what we would call intuitive? And what is the difference between being psychic and being intuitive? In that case, nothing. You know. Well, no, it's, it's, a, it's a gray area. It's the gradual... The gradual yeah. Differences in between. You can be anywhere along the scale. Yeah, and I think I think the frequency in which you have those moments yeah. are what separate you from somebody who can actually say they yeah, are and one. Then, and then you have futurists like H. G. Wells and uh, even Kurtzwill, the current futurists who predict the things in the seventies that are happening now. Yeah, um, but that that's not that's not but, psychic. No, but I think that's the, just the, 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 it's intelligence plus some intuitiveness too you know uh, there was a woman named jean dixon somebody mentioned earlier yep and she made her i think her whole claim to fame was she predicted the kennedy assassination that's right that's all <laughs> she ever predicted but she made a right. whole career off of that by yeah. by writing books about predictions she was always wrong that and was that, the only that, time she police was would right. bring her in to to try to help solve cases and yeah. stuff yeah yeah, and, yeah. And, and, you know, and and you know the old line I've always had about even a stopwatch is you know is, is wrong you know uh, is right twice a day. All these people have to do is do it right once and make a big deal out of it and go out and get a publicist and they've got a career. Yes, uh, Chris. There was another scam. I guess you can't do it anymore. But these guys were putting out nine hundred tweets every April, saying each possible World Series outcome, and then when the World Series would end, they'd delete the other 899 and say, look, I had it. I had it. <laughs> Bet with me. Give me your money. I'll give you tips. You know, Really? So, and there was no record, and no one had saved this guy's, you know, 900 that tweets. That would only work things. once. Yeah, people caught on. Yeah. That Did would only work Jimmy once because... Hey, uh, what? Anybody meet Jimmy the Greek? No. Yeah. Yeah. Meet him? No. No. Remember no. him? Yes. He's. You know. Do you remember what was brought about his downfall? Yes. What was it, Rob? Tell everybody. He was on a broadcast and he made a comment uh, about. Uh, he said something about how African Americans are. Uh, I, about their muscul uh, musculature. He said the, re and... the, re the reason they were so good Faster. at sports and so muscular was it was bred into them. Yeah. And I didn't see that as particularly being out of line because historically that's exactly what slave owners did with these people. You know, uh, they, they were breeding them like they bred cattle. And and I don't know why that was the downfall of Jimmy the Greek. In fact, it's I thought... funny. He, I mean, it's the timing, I think, probably because we, you know, Howard Cosell used to say the most racist things during his broadcasts of uh, Monday Night Football. See that little, such. see that little uh, of, monkey yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. Look at yeah, that monkey run. Yeah, yeah. And he, he, I mean, people noticed it, but he never got in trouble for it. Jimmy the Greek was gone like that. And I, I did, but do you think that Jimmy the Greek was necessarily wrong in his assumption? I mean, it it certainly made some sense. I think I, right or wrong probably isn't the reason why it's offensive to people. So that doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong. 
it's it's the sensibilities that it hits with people and it, it, it still it still implies inferiority in a sense right, yeah. right well no it doesn't no it doesn't didn't no, he make doesn't. a reference to the jungle as well though Did he referred no, to them so. being bred in the jungle or no, something no. And, and he he talked about their breeding when they were slaves in this country and then brought them up here and the whole thing. It was a history behind it or something, I thought he said. Because I don't know about you, but I know I know black guys. Are the only, they don't do any exercise, and they're they buffed like crazy. You know, I, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the only... Have you heard the, the, the Congress lady out west, or is it Mississippi, who said, I like this guy so much, if there was a hanging, I'd, sit, I'd be... Oh, well, that, they, yeah, that... Hanging, yeah, yeah. I'd be in the front row. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Now they're posting her. Today. Hello. They're posting her quotes on billboards all across. What is it, Mississippi? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because she's re she's running. There's a runoff down there. Yep. Yes, Tom. Right. Hello, Tom. You got me. I, I just had to call in because yeah. what you said about Jimmy the Greek, what he had to say was completely wrong. It, it, <laughs> they did. As a matter of fact, they, they they were not breeding slaves to be to be athletes. They were, no, they were no, knocking no, up. The, no, he the, didn't the, say that. They were knocking up the, the, the slave women. They had no genetic or breeding ground, and none of those traits would have been passed on. It has nothing to do do with with. Uh, it, it, I don't think he meant it uh, to be racist. He probably meant it to be complimentary, but it's still wrong. Well, yeah, but, so but was that's it? Not, yeah. <laughs> I just looked up exactly. It was in. It wasn't a broadcast. It wasn't a sports broadcast. He was on WRC in Washington D.C. on television doing a, an interview, and this is what he said: "Well, they got everything. If they take over coaching like everybody wants them to, there isn't going to be anything left for white people. I mean, all the well, players and, are black. Oh, I mean, the uh, only thing the whites control is coaching jobs. The black talent is beautiful. It's great. It's out there." The only thing left for us whites is coaching or coaching jobs. And then he went on to say the thing about, you know, uh, been bred so, that way. So is it the first part that got him nailed or the second part that got him nailed? Because I think it's both. The yeah, whole thing. I, I mean, yeah. when you, when you, take, never, the, when you take, take the beginning of that and then you yeah. put the other part in context with that, yeah, he was racist. Yeah. 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 You know, now, now, Cosell, I, I, I think that was also unconscious and innocent. Uh, I don't know, think he really, but it's still racist, you know, what Cosell said. He, I, I don't think he was out of being mean spirited, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was definitely. By the at way, least, let me put a little side message racism, out here, Jack. Jack, if you're listening to this program right now, would you kill your remote PC? You haven't disconnected from it. Okay, I just <laughs> just calling an audible here. Yeah, yeah, because uh, <laughs> he sometimes goes in there and forgets to turn it off. So, and he's not using it. So, uh, but uh, I, uh, but in, you know, uh, I just think that uh, uh, I thought the only thing he had said was that thing about well, they it was they were bred to be strong. Yeah, you know, and that's I, what I thought too. Yeah, and then I just you know I googled the the comments and they they have the transcript of the of the interview he did. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't he drunk during the TV interview too? Yeah, he, yeah. That's they what they I always a little lit up on that show anyway, weren't they? So. Most of these guys <laughs> who go down are always drunk when they go down for something. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, who was it uh, recently that got in a lot of trouble because they were, I remember Joe Namath got in a lot of trouble because oh, he was, that was loaded. Funny. Musburger just got in a little trouble. He's here in Vegas and, uh, you know, he has a live big glass booth at a casino. He, did, he said something wrong. Not not in a racist way, but about women, perhaps. I, I can't keep track of all this stuff, though. But Musburger just got Musburger's wrong. Musburger's got, got a big drinking problem. Mm -hmm. Are we? So who knows? Maybe. You know, I mean, I, I hate to say this, but are we getting too, uh, too, too politically Politic correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to the point where we're just nitpicky, you know? Uh, if you make a comment like Jimmy the Greek made all that, I don't think that's too sensitive. That all the whole thing, there's no jobs left. They have all the sports. All we have left is the coaching. That's, that, that was terrible. Yeah. That was terrible. Uh, because there's still, who, you look at football teams. Who are the quarterbacks on football teams? The the prime position in football, they're usually white, aren't they? Traditionally, there yeah. are some black. 
now. Can anybody, I don't know the sport that well, can anybody tell me why they're traditionally white? It's it's mixing up now. Yeah, it's mixing it, it up It is now. mixing up now. Yeah. But there was a time where you could have a, you know. A, yeah, there was a time when it was it was pretty dominantly white. And, and I think the coaching is also mixed up too. Yeah, it changed. Yeah. Um, you know, but anyway, it's, it, uh, uh, it, 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 I just think of the people lately who have gone down for one reason or another. And I, and I wonder if it, it just was, it hasn't been too much sensitivity, you know, but then again, I'm the guy who every time Trump says something racial, I get down his throat. So, you know, yeah, but he's the president. He is the president, and he should be an example for everybody. You know, he, he, he should yeah. set the... He, the presidency sets the moral tone of the country, and in this case, what moral tone, you know? It's terrible. Or does the moral tone of the country set the tone of the president? Chicken and egg shit. Yeah, well, that's what Phil believes, because when you mention moral tone, at, that, at, that uh, Trump should be setting it, he disagrees, so you, you, know, you very well could be right. Well, I mean... Well, uh, we may agree... Uh, Phil and I may agree on this, but for entirely different reasons, obviously. Well, I mean, the reason Michelle Obama was so mad at Trump was that whole birther thing, and she felt it put her family's lives in jeopardy. Yeah. And, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't far wrong. I mean, the guy who sent all these bombs yeah. looked like he felt he had a sense of permission. The guy who went in and killed uh, uh, the 12 Jewish uh, families in, uh, was it 12? In, uh, it was 11. You're thinking of the uh, oh. ca attack in California. Well, the, no, the, that the, was 12. No, uh, Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh. Yeah, it was 11. Was okay, it was 11. You know, I'm being, 11. Oh, yeah. quit being picky. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was 11. Uh, he it certainly felt he had a sense of permission. Yeah. You know, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not the job of the president to be giving permission. My, uh, yes, my, yes. my son's uh, daughter is she's in uh, high school and they've got a uh, Jewish racism stuff going on in the high school right now. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, where'd that start from? By the way, yeah. I, don't, I haven't had Phil to tell me this tonight, but we have a full house. Which is very nice. Yeah. Uh, we have a filth-free Thursday too. I, I just realized that. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Two in a row. Y yes, and, and you can tell because Tom called. Yes, Tom. Not only Dan, but God, say yeah. that too. <laughs> I was not going to call that, but when you start talking about Jimmy the Greek, but did, <laughs> did did you hear the the, the you know the, there's a couple of things that, that have happened uh, regarding uh, people <laughs> giving uh, the C Kyle, you know, like they're like. Like there was a whole class of he, high school students, but they, they, they had a picture of them. But, but they weren't. Yeah, they were. Yes, no, they were. Well, he, yes, he, they were. He, here's what the photographer were, says. There was one, he, one, to, he told them one, at one time, one, everybody wave at your, you know, wave at your parents, uh, and no. and they all waved like this. Well, if you look, <laughs> no, no, if you look at the picture, it looks more like people waving at the camera than it does that. If, in other words, it's one of if you want to impress upon the picture that everybody's giving the Nazi salute, then I suppose it looks like that. But if you want to say that everybody was waving, then you could say that too. Did you, um, did you hear the interview with one of the, the guys in the photograph? No. Yeah, the guy that didn't wave? Yeah, he said he felt uncomfortable and he didn't wave. Well, well there was a yeah. few people that didn't wave. No, there were other people that didn't wave too. I counted. Right, yeah. There were about four or five of them. Yes, Tom, what were you going to say? Yeah, uh, I, I was going to mention what Rob did, but also then there's this case of the, they were actually had a, was in Baltimore, they had a, a, a production of Fiddler on the Roof, and a guy right in the intermission started yelling, hail, hail, yeah. hail yeah. Hitler, hail Trump, or yeah. hail, hail Hitler, hail Trump. Maryland. Oh, yeah. Really? The one, somebody in the, it's one of the pro people on the production team, I guess they were saying, yeah, here we go, they were expecting another shootout to occur. Just never thinking of Pittsburgh. They thought it was going to be a repeat. On um, Broadway, uh, they hired uh, Pia Zadora. I don't know if you remember Pia Zadora. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, to, yeah. To play uh, Anne Frank. And there was Stop one. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there was one part of the film 
uh, the film, in the stage play, where the Nazis come in and say, where's the girl? And somebody in the audience yelled, she's in the attic. <laughs> speaking, of the, speak, speaking of the Nazis, here's breaking news. Uh, the, they report that uh, there's, the court documents show federal prosecutors have just filed charges against Julian Assange, head of WikiLeaks. So here, here we go, people. That, that must, is a tragedy. That, that, that's Mueller. Don't you think that that's Mueller? That is a tragedy. Because uh, Julian Assange it doesn't play favorites, and neither does Edward Snowden. I think he no, does. No, I, but, I, but he's not the good. He's not good like Edward Snowden anymore because all the good people around Assange left him, and now he gets all his dirt from crooks and, and mostly Russia. Uh, Assange. He doesn't get freely. He was good, but he turned evil. He turned to the dark uh, side. Assange has had his own agenda, and it is not doing what's right, particularly. He's not. He's not a journalist anymore. I mean, when he is allowing the Russians to 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 see his result of his work, uh, he's he's taken sides. He's a fake psychic. That's how bad he is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tom, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was going to say, um, Alex Gibney did uh, a documentary called uh, We, we uh, Steal Secrets mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, about Assange and WikiLeaks. And, and uh, he came out with a very bad taste in his mouth about, about Assange. And, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, but he, he just, like, Assange just really really did not act very honorable or ethical with him. Well, I... you, you, know, you know what's ironic? The same thing happened to Trump, whose dad had somewhat of a legitimate real estate empire in New York City, and Trump ran into the ground, and eventually he had to go to the Russians for help, just like Assange did when he, when miss, when he lost all of his uh, philanthropists and people that had, had journalistic uh, ethics. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know where Snowden's name came up in the same breath with Assange because they were two entirely yeah. different people and two entirely. Yeah, Snowden different only gave stuff to journalists. He didn't just dump it out there, and he had them vet it. And most of it was was vetted at other sources. Well, he too. also didn't have an agenda. It seemed as though in the end, right. uh, Assange had an agenda. He wanted to get even with the uh, with the uh, uh, Clintons. Uh, was part of his. He agenda. wanted to. He wanted to use the power. He was like a psychic that really wanted to take advantage of people. Yeah. On like the other hand, saying, Snowden only gave out this information because he felt it, America needed to know what was happening. Yeah, he was he was patriotic. Yeah. yeah. Right. And where is he? Still in Russia, right? Right. And there, there we have Russia again, even for the neutral guy. Right? Why yeah. Russia? <laughs> yeah, why Russia? Why Russia? Yeah, well, that would be a good uh, name of a good another documentary. Yeah. So, uh, so, so this latest bit of news is that Assange yep. is going to be indicted. Yeah, I haven't read the whole article. Just posted yeah, well, on now my question is, uh, where does he turn himself in? <laughs> um, at, the, at the bunny ranch. Yeah, I believe. the bunny. He, believe me, <laughs> it, you know, I love it how they, they went indicted uh, these what? Uh, how many Russians? Yeah, like, uh, they, uh, well, come on, give yourself up now. You're you're indicted, you know, for, forget Well, it, actually, you know. Papa, Papadopoulos was, was giving wrong information to the FBI. I he love that man. Cooperating. They would have actually caught one or two of those Russians had he cooperated and told them the truth. Yeah. Tim, I love so that they, name. Papadopoulos. I always call yep. him Papa Cock and Piss. <laughs> Boy, the way your mind thinks, boy. I know. Yeah. But that's why you have me on here, I'm sure. Oh, of course. You're, 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 you're a lovely See, human being. Scott's, Scott's a, nodding his head in compliance. You're a lovely human being. Oh, uh, I am a lovely human being. A wholesome human hey, being. Hey, Scott, we never asked you. Have you ever been to a psychic? Only a Ouija board. Only, <laughs> yeah. Well, Even that, that's too expensive for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ouija boards work because people want them to go a certain way, you know. I use the magic eight ball. That's my uh, <laughs> my before huffing thing. it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, Tom. 
I was just thinking when you were talking about the Sykes, I remembered a, um, uh, I forget which comedian uh, was on your show one day. He said he called the psychic hotline. The first thing the woman said to him was, Visa or MasterCard? He says, hey, you're the psychic. You tell me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Let me see. Is there anybody else I didn't ask? Did I ask you, Brian? Go ahead. What? You ever been to a psychic? Oh, fuck no. I figured that was going to be the answer I was going to get from you. (laughs) I do you bother? Oh, fuck. Fuck no. no. If I ever get fuck you money again made, that's the last, just like before, it's the last place I'll blow my money on. Well, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Rob, who says he's had positive experiences with psychic people, I think you would even have to agree with me, Rob, that for the most part we should probably not embrace these psychics because there are those who are doing harm to people, you know. I mean, you have. But I have to, to say. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I let let Rob finish what he was saying. I mean, you just just like anything else, you have to approach all of these people, and that's everybody. I mean, you, there are quacks, doctors, and financial advisors, and I mean, you, you have to know who you're talking to, and you have to build up either a level of trust with them over time. You don't just go walking into a storefront sit down and let them read the tea leaves and walk out and live your life that way. Well, you know, uh, Teller uh, did a lot of debunking, Penn and Teller. And one of them was in the Philippines. There are people who claim they can cure cancer, and they, uh, they literally will put their hand down into what appears to be the person's, on the person's body and produce uh, a piece of bloody material and saying, I'm now remove the cancer and really what it is it's a chicken liver but, but but there are people that's like, horrible but there are people like yeah. this who give people false hope and through that false hope they don't go and get the real help they should get yes tom of course uh, joe pine uh back on uh, at klac right. uh they sent him to the philippines to uh to uh, investigate these psychic surges and that's what he discovered they had uh, they they made little indentions in the skin and filled it up with some kind of animal's blood, and they would be pulling these organs out. Yeah, and and uh, I don't know if you were work if your wife was working for at the time that he, uh, but uh, that was that was a big thing to that station. Well, that was my the, first wife who worked with him. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So you don't remember that, huh? I don't even remember my first wife. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, let alone. <laughs> Burst them from your memory banks, have we? Yeah. Uh, but do you remember Joe Pine? I do remember Joe Pine. Joe Pine was the original. I mean, he was really the one before Limbaugh, before yeah. uh, 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 Mort, Mort, uh, yeah. uh, what's his name? Mort Downey Jr. Mort Downey Jr. Before all of them, he was the kind of the, uh, the mean guy on radio. And I got to know him because my wife knew him. Now, I don't know if she worked for him or whether she just knew him. But I got to know him a little bit, and one day we were walking down the street, down Santa Monica Boulevard or whatever, Wilshire, and uh, we were talking back and forth. And I was still, I was at Armed Forces Radio and Television Service and wanting to be desperately in the same league as Joe Pine. And he was a nice guy. And we passed by this woman on the street who has her hand out. You know, she wants some money. And he pulls out a $10 bill and gives it to her and then looks at me and says, I will never talk to you ever again if you tell anybody what I just did. <laughs> because he needed to maintain a reputation of being this mean it's person. Of <laughs> you know. And that's when I learned that, you know, whatever you are on radio doesn't mean that's what you are in life. Unless you're Sean Hannity and then you believe it. Yeah. And you have more than two people confirming that he's an asshole off the air, as much as you have millions of people confirming that he is an asshole on the air. Well, I can, You're right. I can confirm off the air that Sean Hannity is a fucking asshole. I can see it. You know, I'm I mean, absolutely. Uh, I did a, a phone thing with him once with Alan Combs. And he was on the phone and I was on the phone. And Combs, of course, was in the studio. And uh, we got into this big argument, you know, and I finally, at one point, I think I said to Sean, I said, Sean, knock it off. You know, we're, we're just in show business, you know, 
Uh, but just as there are different and, and he of says, cancers. I'm not in show business. You know, I'm 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 a serious broadcaster. Yeah. And Combs told me after the fact that when he finally got Hannity off the air at some point, either that night or the wow. next day, Hannity said to him, never put me on with that guy ever again. And I took that as a badge of courage. You know, that's wonderful. <laughs> I was the guy that Sean Hannity never wanted to be on with again. Uh, he was a, uh, he's a fucker. He's an asshole. And um, I know people who were around in the very beginning who said he was a pretty charming, decent guy. And then he started taking what he was doing too seriously. Yes, Brian. All right. Uh, one. Uh, there is a part of as, as skeptical as I am of religion and, and God and psychics and all that. Like, there's a part of me that agrees with what Tim said earlier, and that there's so much. There's still so much we don't know. I mean, hell, we don't even. We only use like 20 percent at most of our brain for for non-cognitive functions as well as cognitive yeah. functions. Yeah. But also, uh, also realize that uh, people like Mike Huckabee are assholes too, because much like a cancer, there are different kinds of cancers, and so there are different types of assholes. They don't ascribe to one playbook for assholes. There are various playbooks. Well, look, I got to tell you that I'm, I, I had Huckabee on on a couple of occasions, and uh, I did not find him to be an asshole. I um, actually, there are plenty I of act assholes with a smile to your face I, and fuck I, you. I, I, actually, I actually like Mike Huckabee. I mean, uh, personally, I and I told him, I said, your politics are crap. OK, I said, but you are charming, you know, and uh, and, 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 and everybody I ever talked to about Mike Huckabee who knew the guy said they felt the same way. They didn't agree with his politics, but he was a very amiable guy. People say I'm an asshole, but I'm not the same asshole that Sean Hannity hell, is. I'm hell, take, you know, hate me. I like Tom DeLay. He was a ter he was terrific. He was. Huckabee's daughter is going to be fired soon. No, she's quitting at the end of the year. She she's already said that. She is. Yeah, yeah she's quitting. Yeah. She said that a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Start of the new year, she's gone. Yeah. I have one last question. I just want to go around the panel. Very simple answer. Rob, do you believe in God? Yes. Uh, you, Brian? No. I. Why did I think that would be the answer from Brian? <laughs> uh, uh, Tim? Because I'm consistent. Tim? Uh, yes, definitely. Oh, okay. Uh, Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> that was reluctant. Yeah, maybe. Could be. Yeah, well, I was, I was brought up a Catholic, went to Catholic school, and I was pounded in my brain, but then you, you know. Tom, do you believe in God? I'm open to the possibility. Ah, very good answer. I like that answer. Of course, we don't have to have ask Scott. Scott goes to church every day, right, Scott? Yes. That is correct. Okay. So every you, day? You, every day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He, he's a tried and true Prime Catholic. Uh, I didn't it, know Catholics. I grew, was born and raised a Catholic. I didn't know Catholics go to church every day. Well, apparently they do. They how, can. How, about, how about you, uh, Jeff? Not, not a player. Not a player. Nah. No. Yeah, okay. So so out of all of you so far, the only person who said he didn't believe in God, well, there are two of you, uh, Brian and Jeff. How about you, t uh, Chris? I'm with Tom. Huh? You're with Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Open to the possibility. Yeah, yeah I got you. And how about you, Bree? I believe in a prime mover. Uh, yep. W w wait a minute. Would that be your, would that be your, uh, your rectum? <laughs> yeah, no, right. That's what. I, that's my prime mover. That's what know. they're going to rename Uranus in thousand years according to Futurama. You wreck them. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I, you know, I, 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 it's interesting the answers I get to that question. I, 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 if we had time, I would ask how many of you gave the answer yes because you weren't going to hedge. You were hedging your bets. <laughs> you, you know. Uh, as for me, I, I see no proof of it. You know, and. Uh, Eventually, you know, and people say to me, well, if you go to heaven and there is a God uh, uh, and you don't believe in God, uh, what's he going to do? Is he going to let you into heaven? And I said, of course, if he's as good as you say he is. I just didn't want to get struck by the whole lightning. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Uh, lightning stuff. Huh? You know, I'll just, I'll be the you first know, one. Hey, Alex, yeah. hey, Alex. Netflix show what? called The Good Place. Excellent. 
you know what they the, what what they say in quantum theory? What the the observer can affect the uh, uh, actual reality outcomes. Oh, okay, that's a, and then with that, we should end the program. Everybody, <laughs> give a big wave goodbye. Thank you all for oh, being part of the door. citizen panel. There they go, ladies and gentlemen. And I likewise will uh, wave goodbye to them. There we go. Okay. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Good show. Really good show. We talked about a lot of shit, too, which is good. That's stuff we don't normally talk about. Hey, I'm out of here. Next is the intersection with uh, Jack Bishop. That will be closely followed at 1 o'clock in the morning Eastern time by Connections. That comes out of Florida tomorrow night. He wasn't on tonight, but tomorrow night, uh, Damien will be back with The Exchange at 9.30 and at 10 o'clock. Hey, it's me. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody.